Okay, well, thank you for having me here this evening. And so tonight, uh, my name is Alan Guthmiller, and uh, thank you. Woo! Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the title of this Go Wet Young Man. And so that kind of alludes to uh, processing desert gold, probably by the use of water, which is kind of unusual, considering most of the time we're out in the desert dry washing, you know. So uh, I just wanted to kind of show you a comparison of the two and the advantages and disadvantages of both modalities to try to inspire you to maybe go wet with the process. So I've been working on it dil diligently with, uh, you know, uh, building my own setup. So we'll go ahead and move on through the, uh, the video here. So let me tell you a little about myself. I was uh, born and raised in San Bernardino, California. Found my first gold and blue cut back in 1975. So if those of you know what blue cut is down in Cone Pass. And I've been hooked with gold ever since. So, and uh, I'm also, really gold mining is not really my main hobby. My main hobby is aviation. I love building and flying and designing aircraft and stuff. And so I also love warbirds too. I like to fly in them too, it's a lot of fun. Uh, also, I'm into uh, astronomy. I like to build and design telescopes. Yeah, I designed this one here I built for astrophotography. It's a 20 inch F5 Newtonian, it's on a trailer, it weighs 2,600 pounds, but yet it's portable and one man can set it up and I can actually ready to start imaging in about 45 minutes when I arrive to a site. Currently I have this out in my property in Arizona, which I'll get into a little later. And of course, gold prospecting. You know, I always enjoy dabbling around out in the field. So, uh, and I also do keep in shape a little bit, do some bicycle riding to kind of keep it there. I live in Henderson, Nevada now. So that's where I'm at now. And I've got a lot of, uh, you know, placer experience, but I've also got uh, some load experience. So this is yours truly many moons ago, uh, working at a hard rock mine just outside of Searchlight, Nevada, pushing on a drill rig. We had a really nice property, good claim out there. And we didn't, uh, we didn't make a lot of money, but we were able to pay for our crushing plant shaker tables and all the other drilling equipment stuff and the dynamite and stuff like that. There's Pete, my friend Pete, and there's yours truly after a hard day of punching holes, you seem a little tired there. And uh, there's me setting off the, uh, the fuse there to go to the, uh, to the detonator, or to the cap, and then to the deck port, and you can see all the charges there in the wall. And of course, the fun after that. <laughs> it's a blast. <laughs> so anyway. But, uh, you know, and over the years I've been prospecting and I've also been looking for sites for astronomy. And I came across this place called the Lost Basin, or actually uh, near Meadview, Arizona. It's about 4,000 feet. It's beautiful territory, nice wide open spaces, dark, dark, dark for skies at night for astronomy. It's perfect. And so I brought uh, a five acre parcel out there. I have a house out there and a garage. So it's kind of like my, you know, getaway place. And it's beautiful. This is the. This is a uh, Mead View is near the uh, rim of the Grand, that's the north rim of the Grand Canyon as it spills into Lake Mead. So we're pretty close to the lake, hence the, hence the name. But this is some of the astronomy that I do. I enjoy doing a lot of imaging and stuff. This is the Cocoon Nebula, a nice little uh, uh, star forming region in, uh, up in the sky, and then uh, some globular clusters. This is an exploded star called uh, the Dumbbell Nebula really cool to look at. Now when you guys are out prospecting, you have a lot of desert claims, don't you? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's probably away from most city lights. So I would really encourage you, you know, at night when you're maybe not digging, to set up some binoculars or a small telescope and scan the sky because especially in the summer months, if you're out dry washing, the Milky Way is across the sky. It's absolutely just phenomenal. So anyway, this is a galaxy with the, uh, uh, another galaxy being Campbell Light, it's called M51. So anyway, um, where I'm at is also called the Lost Basin Mining District. And it's a very small place, not very well known uh, amongst most people. It's, um, uh, this is one of the only miner shack that's ever left. Everything else is completely gone. Uh, production was small, like about 1,500 uh, ounces in the area. Uh, it's kind of tucked away. Uh, most people don't know about it. Most people think about Gold Basin, which is the, uh, down the hill in a ways. So that's more popular. So. And so anyway, I've just been out prospecting and uh, found some places out there, and so I decided to set up some claims. So I have a total of 80 acres, and this is looking at one of my claims. Uh, this is really cool. We're, uh, this is actually a wash, and up here in the corner is a curve. So this whole wash is making this big, huge 90-degree elbow curve here and flowing across here, and this is all exposed bedrock. Okay, so shop back time, get out there and start sucking all this stuff up and you're getting a lot of good gold. And of course, see where these ATVs are parked, that's on the inside curve of the river. 
guess what's there? Yeah. yeah, real good spot for digging for gold. Having a lot of fun with that. And the great thing about this property is every time it flash floods, it restocks itself. So it's a gift that just keeps on giving. It doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah. And then on, behind me, flipping around, now all that material and everything flows down into this wash that acts like a sluice box. And so again, a lot of gold, a lot of fine gold down here and tons of black sand. So it's really a neat place to go out and dry washing. I haven't, oh yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, we're open to buying maps. Buying maps, oh, okay. <laughs> just, oh, let you know. okay. <laughs> well, Jeff Williams is right next to me. Just oh. like, yeah, so if you wanna get on his claims, you can almost come over and visit me too. So <laughs> we're right out there, we're out there together, so. Uh, yeah, by the way, if you guys have any questions, shout out, raise your hand, let me know and everything. Let's kind of keep this a, kind of a friendly talk here. So. Now this is the other claim across the way, near Jeff Williams' claim, uh, that's about another few miles down the road. And this is where I'm getting most of my gold. So uh, this is my glory pit here that I've been working in, and I actually brought some material here from the glory pit so you can kind of see it later on. Uh, the old miners, when they came through back in the 1920s, were uh, dry washing this entire wash behind here up in the top. And they, uh, I noticed when I was there and I was running their tailings, I was getting a lot of good gold. And I was like, that's really unusual. Now, I know dry washing is not quite as efficient as, as wash or with water, but I was still getting really good gold, so I was perplexed why. And the reason why is that the ground is super, super hard, especially in the summer months, it's like rock. In the, in the wintertime, it's kind of a gooey clay. So you really can't run a dry washer very good in the winter when it's gooey, and it's too dang hard to break it down to separate the gold in the dry washer for the most part. So I can see why they were uh, losing a lot of gold. I'm actually, the average gold on there is about $9 a yard. Now with the price of gold up, it's closer to $10 a yard. So that's what it's running. So anyway, I did a cross cut through the wash. You know, they were going this way, I did just 90 degrees to that, and all of a sudden, bang, I hit some virgin ground. And so this is the glory pit that I dug and uh, been working on. And just to show you a little more closer up detail, uh, all this stuff that you see up, up on top is all tailings left over from the old miners. So they actually set the gold, or they're processing right on top of the gold. You know, <laughs> they didn't know that. So all the, uh, where the gold exists is this, see all this rock and pebble running around here. That's just the top layer of what becomes the layer where the gold is trapped at. And then if you look down here, you see these red patches kind of intermixing in between the white patches. That's all gold too. And then down here at the very bottom on the floor is bedrock. So it's about 18 inches to two feet thick. And the white stuff is caliche, so it's fractured, altered caliche. And of course, over time, the stuff is gold's been diving down with the red material and all that, intermixing with all the caliche, which you know I've got some samples over here to show you later on, so you can actually see what the mess I'm digging in. And this is what it looks like. It's very crusty looking stuff. Uh, very, very hard, like I say, in the summertime. Uh, it's really hard to break down. So this is where the wash plant comes in, okay, to help break that stuff down. So here's some of the gold I've been getting out of there. So not bad. Now this is a little deceiving. That larger nugget up there is about three eighths of an inch. Okay, so it's, you know, uh, it's a little bit of a close up. And in fact, I brought the gold with me. It's in my pocket, so I'll show those to you guys later on. And uh, so anyhow, it's not too bad. Now I'll show you some of my toys that I have. I have a little dry washer, it's a small little backpacker. I love to throw that in the back of my ATV. It's so compact, doesn't take much gallon of gas, gallon of water, a pan, and shh, off I go, and I go prospecting. So I use this a lot, okay, it's a lot, a lot of fun. The other toy I've got is the Gold Bug too. so I use this a lot too, especially when I'm uh, running my wash plant, either dry wash or, or the wash plant itself, I always scan the header piles afterwards, because you never know if you have a nugget larger than your screen size that's sitting there, you know, so, and it, it, in my case, it's quarter inch. So if there's a quarter inch nugget, the Gold Bug will go crazy over. So this is the wash plant right here. Um, we'll get more into the details of it. I have videos on YouTube on how this is all created. This wash plant I posted a couple of years ago. It has over 260,000 views now on YouTube. So it's really gotten popular over, over the time. And of course I have newer updated videos with some of the latest upgrades that I've made to it and stuff. But basically what it is, it's a trommel up here, all made out of simple materials in the hardware store. Five gallon buckets, PVC pipe, uh, one inch electrical conduit, swamp cooler bearings, you know, all the basic stuff. The motor drive that drives these is actually a windshield wiper to a Jeep. And so, 
And I actually, I have on my web, on my site, on my YouTube channel, I also have a tutorial on how to build one of these, step by step by step. So you can actually build one of these things yourself. So uh, anyhow, and then of course the sluice is sitting right here. The key is the whole operation is this trommel down here. This is the dewatering trommel. So what it does is it separates the material from the water and recycles the water. So I can technically run in the, uh, on an average month when the ground is slightly moist, but mostly dry, I can run about a yard of material uh, before I have to purge things. And uh, so, and I'm running, I use about maybe a hundred gallons a day instead of thousands of gallons. So I'll get in more of that later on. But that's the key of a desert wash plant is to preserve that water as much as possible. Now after a, a yard, because I have such clay gooey material, the, the material just, the water just gets gummy after a while. So you just gotta dump it and start over, start fresh. So anyhow, this dewatering trommel has a 60 mesh screen. So anything that's plus 60 gets thrown out on the tailings, anything minus 60 drops in the tub. So the tub does eventually fill up. And then the secondary tub as well, and of course in the secondary tub you'll see a video, I have filters here. So I have a 200 mesh screen and a 400 mesh screen that filters all the particulates. And then when it goes into the third tub that's off the picture there, it's pretty decent pure water to get pumped back up into the trommel to keep root processing. So anyway, we'll get into that. So anyway, let's talk about some of the considerations for uh, desert versus, uh, during wet versus dry. Uh, one is location, you know, is the property that you're going to easy, accessible, easy to drive to, or is it up in the hills and you got to backpack and hike up to it? That's really a, a factor. The other is type of material. Is it gooey clay like I'm dealing with, or is it gravel, easy stuff, a lot of black sand? Uh, that's a, and then also your recovery, you know, are you looking for maximum or minimum recovery? If you're just, you know, out there prospecting, maybe you just want to see if it's got anything. Uh, if you want to run production, obviously you probably want maximum recovery. So those are some of the things to think about. Uh, type of equipment, what kind of toys do you own, you know, or willing to own. So that's another thing. And of course, setup time, you know, that's a key factor. You know, you're going to be there for a couple hours, you're going to be there for a couple of days. You know, that's another factor. And also your vehicle capacity. What do you have? A truck, truck with trailer, toy hauler, you know, uh, or you just got a little SUV. So that's another thing to consider. And finally, it's your personal physical abilities. You know, what are you able to handle? What kind of equipment can you physically handle? So those are some of the keys. So now let's talk about the dry washer. I want to talk about the pros and cons of dry washing, okay? So the pros, portability. Hey, real easy to set up. Uh, uh, and even remote locations, backpack it. And uh, then a quick setup time, maybe 10, 15 minutes, maybe even less if you're good at it. Minimal moving parts, which is nice. Low maintenance, which is the next part. And minimal support equipment. You just need some fuel probably, uh, a shop vac, some pan, a basin, some little bit of water, and you're good to go for the weekend. You know, not bad. Now the cons about this is that I know some of you guys are going to be kind of frowning on this, but the average gold recovery really is only about 50 to 60 percent, and I'll prove it to you. And uh, so even though some people say, oh, well, my dry washer gets all the gold because I run through the dry washer again and I don't get anything. Yeah, that's probably true because <laughs> it won't work the second time. Or maybe you get by random chance, you get a little bit more in your dry washer the second pass. So, uh, but we'll get into that. I'll get into the physics of why. Okay, in a little bit. Anyway, uh, moisture content is critical. You know, it's got to be minus 5% in order to have uh, good water washing recovery. Now, you can tweak it and maybe get 70% out of it by really fine tuning everything, get the right levels, get the right volume, and everything else so you can get a little bit more recovery. And also, I'll show you here in a minute what I have set up to improve that recovery. Uh, the other thing is that uh, unable to break down hard material and clumpy material. Because when you're shoveling your material into the upper hopper, you got your grid screen to classify, and you know, things roll off and things fracture off and break off and fall into the hopper, but a lot of it still rolls right off into the header pile, right? Okay? And then the stuff that falls, if you got like what I'm doing, well, if you got stuff that drops into the hopper, that's still conglomerated, it's still glued together. So when it drops onto the riffle board, it just and off into the tailings, you know, and then that little piece of gold is trapped inside and you'll never get it. And then uh, limited seasonal use. Anybody dry washing the past few days or a few weeks? <laughs> it's pretty wet out there, isn't it? It's going to take till June for the ground to dry, I'll tell you. But you know what? The desert blossoms are going to be awesome this year. Yes. They're going to be fantastic. 
So, and of course, the other thing is the dust hazard. You have to use a mask. Sometimes people have a higher incidence of valley fever and other kind of spores and fungus that's in the soil that can you know affect you and stuff like that. Especially if you have low immunity. So there's a little, little bit of that. So let's go over here to the wash plant and look at the pros and cons of that. Uh, first of all, the average recovery is about 80 to 95 percent, and that's if you have again set up just right and everything, everything working well. Moisture content not a factor. You can run it dry, you can run it wet, because you're going to wash it anyway. Uh, effective breakdown of hard material and clumpy cake, absolutely. Okay, that's exactly what you want. You want to break down all that clay, completely disseminate it so it's just nothing but silt. And that way it frees up those little particles of gold. Unlimited seasonal use. Use it any time, as long as your water's not frozen. You know, uh, I, pro I run my stuff in the middle of summer, I mine at night. You know, I just set up some lights and everything, have my snake boots on, and uh, so I'm out there mining at night. That's the way to go. It keeps the sun from beating on you. Now, the cons is that a wash plant is not as portable. No way, not even close. Okay, it takes uh, it, all the equipment, and it also increases time 30 to 60 minutes, depending on where you're at and how to set it up. Now, where I'm at, I'm fortunate. I have steel spikes in the ground. And everything is perfectly measured, so that way every time I come out, I just drop the trowel, drop the sluice, everything, it's all in order, so it's just boom, 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 and it takes me 15 minutes to set up, okay? And I have a video on that, so if you go on my channel, I have a video, it's kind of fun to watch and everything, because I have it in fast motion and everything. I have a little clock turning and everything, so you can watch how fast I'm setting it up. Uh, multiple support equipment, you need fuel, batteries, uh, pump, hoses, filtration system, you know, tubs, all that kind of stuff, a lot of extras to fill up your truck or your uh, toy hauler. Uh, multiple moving parts, increased maintenance, oh yeah, bearings and uh, all kind of, you know, pumps and motors and hoses and stuff like that. And yes, every once in a while I have a Todd Hoffman moment and everything where everything goes <laughs> and starts gushing water all over the place and gets jammed up. So yeah, it's kind of funny. And then uh, also, uh, you know, your water supply, you're out in the desert. Where are you going to get the water? You know, so you got to haul your water. So you got to have some modality to do that with. And then finally, yeah, you're going to get money. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the uh, dry washer first. Okay, I'm going to get more into the physics here. I uh, hope everybody's still awake. Uh, so this is just a cross section of the dry, uh, standard uh, vibrostatic dry washer. And so you have your incoming air coming up through a system on the bottom. And you have your fan with the counterweight in there to help vibrate it and shake it. And then some of the more advanced uh, dry washers have a diffusion plate to help distribute the air across the entire floor of the dry washer. And then you have your canvas floor, and then you have your rivets. Okay, and that's just the basic, you know, I'm not getting technical here, but just the basic setup. Okay, so now let's get into the physics of dry washing. Okay, first of all, we know that black sand or iron or is about four times lighter than gold, so gold's four times heavier than black sand. Okay, if you look at a periodic table. And so, therefore, that's something to keep in mind how this all works. All right? So if you have air coming up through the floor, you have enough quantity to come up to actually lift the lighter volume of material over these riffles and out to the tails. Okay? So you have, a, a, you have so much volume to lift all that, but so that the gold will actually trap. You know, you'll have the gold and black sand settling. But the problem is, is that if you get not enough volume coming up through the floor, a lot of the big chunks of black sand will settle into the riffles and start clogging up your riffles. You're not going to get any more gold. So is there's that balance that has to be really maintained. And so if you have a chunk of black sand this size, okay, uh, and it weighs a certain amount, and you have enough volume coming through here to lift that over the riffle, okay, the same size piece, the same weighted piece of gold is going to be this size, okay. So what's going on is that this has more surface area than this. This is more dense than the black sand. So naturally, it will fall to the riffle and get trapped in the dead zone, okay? And we see that, you know? When you're out dry washing, you get some nice pieces, and no doubt about it. You notice you don't see any real super fine stuff. And if you do, you're hitting a really a lot of fine stuff, okay? And so that gets to the other part. If you have a small piece of gold, okay, it's so tiny, that's getting lifted out with the fine material. And so you're not really capturing. Now you get some, like on my claim, if you, it's because I got so much of it, that you will see it in the dry washer, okay? Because it's just so much. But you're not capturing the full amount. The other problem is that if you have a piece of gold that's this size and they both weigh the same, but if it's flat, which I call a surfboard nugget, 
okay? Well, now you just got this massive surface area. So what happens with the surfboard nugget, just like in the surf, is it goes and just flips right out and out onto your tailing piles. So recovery of really super fat, flat, paper thin nuggets are kind of challenging with a dry washer. So now let me ask you guys, what is the most common force in nature that works with us in terms of gold prospecting? Gravity. Gravity. Why are we defying gravity here? In other words, we're defying gravity. In other words, we are working in such a narrow window for gravity to work in our favor that anything outside that window, we lose all the gold. So the zone in which we're trapping any gold is very narrow, very, very critical, okay? So that, that's the issue with the dry washer. And again, I'll prove to you this later on here. So now I have a proposal idea, which I brought with me, so you can actually come up here and see it later on, is that what I propose is that classifying the material on the fly. So what you're doing is you're putting all your, say my material's quarter inch, okay? So I got quarter inch material coming over here. I propose building a 20 mesh screen over the lower ripples, okay? So that way all the bigger particles that are plus 20 mesh flow out onto the tails and everything else smaller drops through, okay? So now you're classifying down the material so the black sands and the pieces of gold are a little closer to equal. Not perfect, but equal, okay? And, but the problem exists is that you still got a volume of the same volume of air coming through all this. So if you have that, you're gonna have these small pieces of gold just getting thrown right out along with the riffle, just like you had up here, okay? So the other proposal is to put a baffle down here, which happens to be a 75 mesh screen. Now you can also double your uh, fabric material too, it'll do the same effect, okay? So you just wanna baffle down the volume coming through this section. Well, what happens is now all of a sudden you're starting to trap some of that finer gold, and you'll see that. So that's kind of my proposal. And I have all this here. Here's what it looks like. Um, this is a 20 mesh screen, by the way. I get all my screens on eBay. You can get all kinds of shapes, sizes, and dimensions. And so this is a 20 mesh. This is a I forget what he it's a heavier gray 20 mesh screen. And then you can see this little bit of uh, white here. This is a piece of spruce that I have sitting in the riffle to help lift the screen about a quarter inch over the riffle so you're not jamming you know up against the screen when the stuff's going over so it's lifted off you'll see it here it's right here so you can take a look at it later and then this is the underside showing this uh, screen baffling on the bottom side this is my black tape here for my dead zones on my on my riffle board so now this is the challenge here I put my eyeballs back on so i can see what i'm doing I got a bail out of this. Okay, and I'll show the video here because just the way my system works. Da, 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 da. Dry washer screen. So we're going to watch this dry washer screen in action. <laughs> You can see here as the material is flowing through, all the coarser stuff is going over the top. Most of the fine stuff is dropping right down here. So hopefully we got all the finer material getting worked on down below these lower three riffles. Let's move on to the wash plant. Yeah, let me just, all this little technical stuff we gotta take care of. There we go, okay. So it's gonna move on to the wash plant. Now this is my current wash plant that I have with the upgrade, I put a feeder hopper on top. So, because I'm dealing with this gooey hard clay, it actually pre-washes the material before it flows down into the trommel down below here. I have a grizzly back here. Originally I was feeding the material into this hopper. I cut a hole in the back of it, made a 45 degree angle with a grizzly so all the 
uh, coarse material rolls off into the tailings here, and then I've got another header pile out here that comes out of the trommel. So that's just kind of how it all works. So let's get into a little bit about wet washing. So um, here we're using gravity in our favor. Okay, this is a typical Hungarian riffle system, very common. Uh, it has, you know, uh, you have your miner's moss and carpet floor and expanded metal here on the bottom, and you have your set of curved riffles here. So, and of course the feed comes over the side, and of course you have the water flowing over all these riffles, and every time it flows over, it creates a vortex. So you have these vortices going on all the way down the riffle board. And of course it traps, it causes the gold to fall and trap into all this stuff, down here in the, into the moss and or on the carpet and also into the riffles. The only problem with this is that you need, in order for it to function, you need a lot of volume of water, okay? And what happens is that you get too much volume, you're taking all your fine gold and keeping it suspended because there's not enough vortices going on to cause it to drop and it just shoots right out the back of the, off the sluice. Uh, if you slow it down any, then all of a sudden your riffles start packing. Well, if it's packing, then you're not trapping any gold. That's a problem. You can increase the slope if you want to help improve that, but then you reach a point where all of a sudden the vector of gravity, gravity is this way, and you're tipping it this way, all of a sudden now your vector is changing. So now all of a sudden you're starting to spill the gold out from your riffles. So that's another little problem with this. And I found that out. I experienced that where I was actually finding gold on the very last riffle. And I have an A52 sluice, a keen A52. That's not good, okay? So I decided to work with a, a company called in Snake River Products, and we came up with a new uh, riffle system. That's this guy here. It's called the Double Stack V uh, Riffle, and we we'll commonly call it the Pickle Puss. And so what this is is a whole bunch of little Vs stacked high-low, high-low, all the way around. And what's really neat about this is that it creates multiple vortexes as you're going along, okay? So it causes that gold to drop down. The other plus is that instead of, like I was using 3,700 gallons an hour, okay, for the Hungarian riffles, this one here I'm only using 1,700. So actually my layer in which the water is flowing over this is only a quarter inch thick on a 10 inch sluice. That's how, that's how low it is. So therefore, though, that water flowing over is getting all this material to actually hit those Vs. Now, I'll get into a little more detail here. A little close up. I find most of my nuggets trapped in the center of the Vs. I find some up front too. Most of the finds are trapped behind the Vs. And the cool thing, by the way, I have this sitting right here so you can come up and check it out, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, the find stuff traps behind, like I said, but what's really interesting is those darn surfboard nuggets that are really hard to trap in anything. What happens is the surfboard nugget starts spinning when it reaches this part here, and it gets trapped back here. And you'll watch it drop down behind this first double stack, and it'll sneak up here and park itself behind this roof right here. It's really awesome. You'll know, also get larger nuggets trapping behind some of that too as well. <laughs> so it works very efficiently. Now, the other thing too is that I'm getting most of my gold in the upper two-thirds of that, of that sluice of, on this system. Nothing down below at all. So all, including 400 mesh gold, 400, okay, is trapping in this upper third, which is really awesome. Because when I finally go to the fine process, I use a blue bowl, which Tom sold me a while back. I, it's amazing to actually take a paintbrush after you spun it and everything, and you sweep up the gold, and you've got these three little nice piles of, you know, 200, 400 mesh gold sitting there. It's like, wow. And it adds up, and I got it in my pocket here. You can see it tonight. I'll show it to you. That's why I sold it to you. Yeah, <laughs> works good for that stuff. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is what this stuff looks like. So you can come up here and see it. But anyway, it's just it's a rubber mat that's double stacked. You know, we just glued the upper part on top of two others to make it a double stack, and it works really well. It sits right now. This is an insert for my A52. Now the one I have in my videos on YouTube, we actually made a whole new sluice. Okay. So this was the early first uh, experiment project that we had before we st stuck with this. All right, so let's show the video here as a wash plant. So let me exit out of here. Go to videos and wash plant in action. So this is the feeder hopper. Just loading up that red gooey clay. And there again, pre-washed. And you'll see all the stuff flowing down here over the grizzly. Most of it going down into the trommel. I accept two inch rock. So here it is. It's 
spinning, this is uh, coming out onto the header pile. Quarter inch screen. Coming down to the sluice. The sluice has got channels to help stabilize the water before it hits the ripple. So you get laminar flow. Dewater trauma in action. You can see the filtration going on. And your water loss is really minimal. Actually, it takes be better than that. Sometimes it really comes out bone dry, depending on the clay content. So you can see my pile of material down there. This is my secondary tub that's all pouring into, where I've got two screens, uh, a 200 mesh and a 400 mesh screen. Then it goes to the third tub, which is the pump tub, and the, uh, the pump. So, all right, what comes it out of that? Let's go back to the videos, the pictures. And by the way, I have videos on my website, or my uh, YouTube site, all this stuff, so you can go check it out. All right, and let's uh, do this. Stop slideshow. Okay, so we yiggy act about all this stuff. Here's the test results. Okay, here's a pan of gold. I ran through my dry washer without any screens, without any filtration, or anything like that. Four five gallon buckets of tailings from the 1920s, and this is the gold I got. Okay, decent, not bad. Four five gallon buckets got some decent gold. That's how much they left behind. This is the gold that I captured with the screen. So if you look at that, you see all the little, there's finer stuff parked in here too, by the way. Um, you can see all the gold there. If I back up one, you can see that's about another 20%. Okay, so that's with the screen, 20%. Okay, so now finally what I did is I took all that material, both header and tailings, dragged it all up to the wash plant, fed it into the wash plant. And this is what I got. So you can see all this gold all up through here, all the a couple little pieces here, a lot of fine stuff that got missed by machine, completely by the dry washer. So think about this. If you, I ran four buckets. How many buckets are in a cubic yard? Anybody know? 45 gallon bucks. It's 39 and a half in some change. So 45 gallon buckets equal one cubic yard. So you can imagine that 10 times the gold in this picture that you would have walked away from if you ran a yard. Okay? I run a yard in a day without a problem. Okay? You can imagine 10 times this amount of gold that you didn't recover on your first pass with your dry washer. Ten times that amount. But of course, you also you would have quite a nice haul too. You'd have ten times this amount for your gold. So you'd have a good day anyway. So <laughs> with all these different pictures here, you can see that the wash plant is still effective, still more efficient than dry washing. And it's just a matter of what you want. So let me ask you, what do you think? Quick yeah. question. You ran the dry washer. Uh -huh. Then you ran the dry washer with a screen. Mm -hmm. That first goal was already out. Yep. Mm -hmm. So with the screen, you got that much more. Mm -hmm. And then you ran, took that out, and then you ran it through your wash plant, and mm -hmm. you got that much more. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And I didn't want to, you know, and honestly, I didn't want to confuse you. If you go my, if you watch my video on how to improve recovery with a dry washer, it's a 25 minute video, okay? And I get really down into the nuts and bolts of it. So, uh, what's really going on in this picture is the first pass with no filters, okay? But it also includes the gold on the upper half of these riffles on the second pass. I didn't want to confuse you, but that's what it is. So, because you're going to get some gold by random chance dropping into the riffle on a second pass, okay? Just by the way things randomly work. So, therefore, what you're seeing here on this next picture here is solely... What came out of this right here so that's what you're seeing that came out of that but i didn't want to confuse you right off the bat with that because it's a little, little weird to try to explain so and then of course at the end you can see all the fine gold all parked through here you know that uh, got collected that got missed so anyway um this is my youtube channel uh, it's no longer Alan Guthrie, I changed it to Alan's Gold Mining. I got cards up here if you want to pick some up and everything, so if you forget. Um, but I have all kinds of videos. I have tutorials on how to build a, a dry or how to build a wash plant. I have the tutorial on how to modify your dry washer. 
some other stuff, some modifications to my wash plan. I've also got some Warbird stuff as well, all mixed in here, and also a solar eclipse from a couple of years ago was up in Wyoming for that. So it's uh, quite nice. And so you can get a hold of me at Allen's Gold Mining, and that's my YouTube channel. Or if you can't remember my name, you can just key up Trommel, Wash Plant, Gold Mining. I'm on the front page of, of it all. So you'll see me up there dressed in this crazy outfit. Or you can also email me, which I have on the cards, at allen.goldmining at gmail.com. So anyway, that's all I have to say. So get out there and find some gold.